uh, it's time to start. I'm going to mute the people in Zoom. Uh, and if you need to say something, you unmute yourself and so on. And we'll do that after the, uh, when we get to the conversation, the discussion uh, part. <clears throat> so, as planned, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, the chapters in the book Battlegrounds. Well, I can't. <laughs> Would you show it to them over there? This is the same book, anyway. The battle, the chapters in the book Battlegrounds that deal with Afghanistan by H.R. McMaster. And there is, that's the book. The book will be donated to the library today. And so if you want to access it, you can. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to do that, and then after that, Ed Corey will talk about what happened afterwards. In other words, what happened after uh, August uh, 15 uh, of last year, <clears throat> and where we are now. So let me get started. Unfortunately, I can't. I don't know how to set the viewing system so that you can see me talking, but I'll have a mask anyway. And today in we have to wear a mask because of the uh, the, uh, the COVID uh, business is still raging. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Can, can you people just, can you people see the share screen in Zoom. Yes, Roger does. Okay, thank you. All right, so <clears throat> um, before we go into the Afghanistan part of it, I want, would like to just go over very quickly uh, the premise of his book, uh, the first couple of chapters of his book. And um, they are essentially that uh, they, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in uh, 1989 and the victory of the Gulf War in 1990, the United States and the world uh, entered in an overconfidence uh, era, which eventually turned into pessimism. And uh, these produced flawed assumptions. This is, all, again, the opinion of H.R. McMaster's in the book Battlegrounds. And <clears throat> some of the examples, I'm going to reiterate them for you. Uh, <clears throat> the end of history, you might remember the philosopher Francis Fukuyama. Uh, he came up with this idea that now that uh, the Soviet Union had collapsed, all countries in the world would accept democracy. And that will be the way of governing the world. Um, <clears throat> that, in other words, ideological competition is over. Uh, then um, <clears throat> uh, President uh, Bush said that there is a new world order and uh, that the world will be getting together and with international organizations, we're going to solve all the problems. And therefore, there is no great power competition anymore. And <clears throat> the U.S. military is all might. It can strike down anybody, any country, in any matter. So military competition is over. But of course, very soon thereafter, autocracy made a comeback. Putin became the president of Russia. Chavez became the president of Venezuela. And eventually, um, Hungary uh, got uh, Orban and he's autocratic, and, and Poland got an autocratic government, and then the Philippines did, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> there's a problem with that, uh, <clears throat> that assumption. China, and and uh, in terms of the world order, well, China surged, and so did its army. <clears throat> so China and the United States seem to be fighting this war of the, who is greater, who is the bigger, 
and who is the more powerful? And the U.S. military all my, uh, is almighty. Well, jihadists terror grew, and uh, as we will see, we didn't do all that great as we expected. <clears throat> so the assumption of the uh, <clears throat> ideological competition being over, that all countries will be democratic, is sort of shrunk. Uh, the assumption that uh, all our international organizations will take care of problems that also shrink, and the assumption that the U.S. military is almighty also shrunk. At the height of the overconfidence of the U.S., the United States was attacked in 9-11. <clears throat> we went to war with Iran and Afghanistan, but that turned out to be Again, not as expected, they are not as longer, more difficult, costlier. And then we were hit with the 2009 economic meltdown. So <clears throat> optimism and, and confidence eroded. Under Obama's presidency, which was characterized more than pessimism and resignation, the United States withdrew from Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the United States blamed the Western capitalist imperialism as the root of the world's problems. And the United States did not act uh, in retaliation in Syria when uh, <clears throat> the United States promised to, to act in case they used chemical weapons against their own people. So in summary, um, the U.S. foreign policy since 1990 has been, well, wishful thinking has been mirror imaging. Mirror imaging means that the person who is analyzing something or some people believe that those people act the same way as he does. Confirmation bias <clears throat> is the idea that any new development just confirms what you really know. And finally, <clears throat> Uh, the belief that others will conform to the, whatever the United States says. <clears throat> so this is the premise of his book. And then he goes country by country to tell his idea of what has happened and what should be happening, how we should deal with them. We talked about Russia, we talked about China, today we're going to talk about Afghanistan. Afghanistan, there is Afghanistan, is a landlocked country surrounded by other spam countries, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, Iranistan, and uh, <clears throat> here is another view of the country where you can see that it is very mountainous. And by the way, you can see uh, that Tora Bora that will come up in a minute. In a minute. At Tora Bora, uh, you may not remember what that is, but we'll come back to, to that in a second. Okay, so he starts his chapters on Afghanistan reminding us of why we were there. And we were there because of the 9-11 attack in the United States. Al-Qaeda attacked the United States. We knew it was them, they admitted it, and the United States asked uh, Afghanistan to turn them over. But the Afghanistani government, the Taliban, refused to do that. And therefore, well, even though the original objective of the United States was to go into Afghanistan and destroy those people or just extract them and destroy them that way, the objective also became to get rid of the Taliban because they were in, in our way of getting Al Qaeda. So, <clears throat> a combination of special forces, CIA, NATO, uh, the NATO alliance, and, and the Northern Alliance. The Northern Alliance were tribe groups in Northeast Afghanistan. Uh, this alliance defeated uh, the Taliban uh, and Al-Qaeda, but did not destroy them. Now, <clears throat> Please note that at this time when we entered, and that was in October 7, I think, October 7 of 2001 already, is that when we invaded Afghanistan, at that time, there were 
are very, very few American troops there. In fact, there probably were fewer than 10,000 troops when we entered, when we invaded the country. Um, and um, by December 6, uh, the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda were retreating. They were escaping all over to, to, to Pakistan. Um, and uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. That might have been a big mistake of the United States, and it might be one of the reasons why we are where we are today. Uh, by December 20th, the whole country had been taken over, and a new government uh, was ruling over Afghanistan. So <clears throat> then the, the next step began, which is the rebuilding uh, Sorry, um, <clears throat> what I was going to say is that um, Al-Qaeda and Taliban eventually went over to Pakistan, and there they started rebuilding. So according to uh, McMaster, from 2001 on, an inconsistent, inadequate strategy gave the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and other jihadist groups there seemed to be about 20 other groups in that region, jihadist groups. If we gave them time to organize and regain strength. So the major assumptions when we went in uh, were these. Now, this is a narrow counterterrorism only event. That was the premise. We go there, we defeat Al-Qaeda, we come out, that's the end. Well... It was a 20-year war, don't forget, you know, so that, that didn't really uh, uh, work out. Um, but the, the fact that we were, we, we were we're staying in Afghanistan with this idea that we're going to leave in a, at any moment caused all sorts of trouble. Uh, for example, look at the, the, in May 20, 2003 already, Rumsfeld announced the end of major combat operations. In 2014, Obama declared the, the, end of, the, the end of the war. Trump campaigned by, you know, on the idea of withdrawing from Afghanistan. And then, on February 2020, the Trump administration, engaging directly with the Taliban, they signed a, an agreement that would, uh, would uh, recall the troops, American troops, by... Uh, 2021, and then Biden, um, under pressure from the from Thiel, well, they announced that the forces will in fact be withdrawn uh, by September. I think that the, if he really wanted to, he could have said, "No, we, we're tearing out that agreement and we're going to do something else." But I think that his idea too was that it was time to to, to leave Afghanistan. But in any case, the point here is that this war always was with the idea that this is a quick thing. Enter, do the job, and go, come out. And we did that for 20 years. And so some people have even said that this is a one-year war 20 times over. <clears throat> Another major assumption <clears throat> is that the Taliban was separate from Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups. This assumption, of course, led us to start negotiating with the Taliban itself. And even with the exclusion of the Afghan government. Now, the Taliban had said to the Americans that we don't want to talk with those people because they don't exist. And they're really not the legitimate government of uh, Afghanistan. And the United States agreed. And we have been negotiating with the Taliban, you don't remember this, probably, from 2009 on. Well, years we have been engaging with the Taliban in negotiation. So, <clears throat> uh, this was uh, one of the assumptions that uh, they were different from Al Qaeda, and, we'll, and we know that they were not. Um, another assumption was that the Taliban would negotiate in good faith. We also know that that was not uh, true. Yet another uh, assumption 
or that Pakistan would end or dramatically reduce its support of the Taliban and other terrorist organizations. Don't forget that Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, and when they left Afghanistan, they entered into Pakistan, and they settled it. And Pakistan could have, suppose, at least could have tried, to, to annihilate them, or at least to, to not help them. But uh, the, other, the, the opposite was true. The Pakistani military, which runs the government, which runs the country, the Pakistani military must continuously help Al Qaeda and, and the Taliban. So um, this assumption was also faulty. The assumption, of course, led to us sacrificing Afghanistan security in order to have good relations with Pakistan. We constantly were talking with Pakistan, and uh, we have a problem there because Pakistan is a nuclear state, and they, you know, and so. We have to be, I don't know, careful. And so we allowed them to sustain and to maintain and to help even uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in their territory. And that, of course, hurt uh, uh, Afghanistan. That's what it means, that uh, we sacrificed Afghanistan security in order to maintain our good relations with Pakistan. All of these assumptions were wrong. But there are other things, other issues. Um, one other issue is the non-destruction of the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. According to him, he's a general, don't forget. Uh, he thinks that if we had destroyed, if the United States or the Alliance had destroyed the uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban uh, in December of 2001, in Tora Bora, as a matter of fact, you remember I pointed out the state, the point on the border between Afghanistan and, and, uh, and Pakistan. <clears throat> that is the place where the remnants of the, the forces of Al Qaeda and um, the Taliban uh, went. That's where they went when they left Afghanistan in Tora Bora. And uh, we should have, according to him, annihilated them right there and then. But we did. And we didn't because we didn't have sufficient American troops there. And because the government somehow denied sending more troops. So anyway, the point is that they were not destroyed. They went into Pakistan. And there they slowly, during 20 years, they rebuilt and they rebuilt. Another major issue I'm sorry. Another major issue is that the the effort for nation building was fragmented, inadequate, chaotic, anything you want to call it, it just was not a good plan. Um, my own son at that time was Lieutenant Colonel. He spent a year in, in Pakistan as an engineer. And he was in charge of supervising constructions and, and things like that. And uh, he told me many stories about um, stupid projects, um, the bad implementation, uh, the corruption, and, and other uh, problems. So <clears throat> all that effort was inadequate. It even started with no money at all, then with an enormous amount of money that the country could not absorb, and so on. More problems. <clears throat> American military and diplomatic efforts were not in sync. They were not synchronized. They did not work together. And so one part would have announced a withdrawal when the other part was negotiating, when the negotiating part should have made withdraw on a condition or something. Anyway, so that, that was another problem. <clears throat> uh, corruption and organized crimes were right rampant in the whole country. And to a certain extent, allowed by the Karzai government. Uh, this is Karzai. Um, as uh, expeditions, as something that you have to live with. Because uh, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, 
uh, he had to live with powerful uh, overlords. And so in exchange for being quiet and being loyal to the central government, he allowed them to be corrupt. And uh, he expected the United States to understand that. Oops. <clears throat> Another problem is that by 2012, frustration with the, I mean, with the uh, Karzai government was really at its peak. And uh, vice versa, Karzai was up to, up to here with the American people. And they just did not understand each other. They did not work together. And so the distrust, mutual distrust, really uh, began at that time. And that is when the United States started talking uh, really with Taliban. They really started in 2009, but uh, it, made, it became more important to talk to them after that. So <clears throat> what do you do in a situation like this? And so what does he recommend uh, to do in Afghanistan in a situation like this? This book, by the way, uh, came around at the end of last year, uh, 2020. And uh, so before Afghanistan fell, but he knew, of course, all the plans that were going on, all the discussions that were going on. Anyway, his recommendations um, at that time are the following. You really have to accept that this is a long time commitment and just stop this one year, year by year thing. Another one is that you have to introduce reforms of all sorts in order to control corruption in Afghanistan at all levels. And um, you have to get Pakistan to stop supporting the Taliban, perhaps by stopping economic and military aid. Wow, okay, that's, that's possible. Finally, military and diplomatic efforts need to be aligned. So look at the first three. Um, what he recommends, long-term commitment. Another 20 years, maybe? Reforms to control corruption. That has been tried for 20 years already and that has not worked. Why, why should it work now? And get Pakistan to change its ways regarding the Taliban. The Pakistan did not, the military did not want to do that because these organizations were important to them. They were important to Pakistan when the Russians were in fact in Afghanistan. Um, and, and uh, <clears throat> they were important to them also uh, against India, which is the other part that Pakistan has to deal with. So what I am saying, this is not him now, this is what I am saying is that the first three, what to do in the list, long-term commitment, reform to control corruption, and get Pakistan to stop supporting Taliban, uh, I think that they're really very, very difficult things to achieve. And uh, so I guess uh, putting myself in the shoes of the president, the United States president, what should I do? Accept these recommendations and start anew or just get the hell out? And uh, well, well, you know what happens. So <clears throat> this is what is in the book. This is how the chapter ends. However, before I close, I would like to show you something else. When, Taliban, when the uh, Afghanistan fell in uh, August 15, 2021, the following day he was uh, <clears throat> he was interviewed by PBS, and this is part of the interview, a small part. The, the core argument from President Biden is that it was not in the interest of the United States to keep troops in Afghanistan any longer, whether one month or one year or 10 years. What do you respond to that? McMaster, well, it's a pie tree. We are already seeing the horrible humanitarian consequences. There will be severe political consequences in connection with our credibility, with our allies and partners, wondering whether we are reliable. Uh, it will have security implications in connection with the jihadist groups. The jihadists beat the United States 
Now, will not now they do something more, something bigger? Uh, the Trump and Biden administrations had this delusion that they that we could actually partner with Taliban against the terrorists, when in fact we were enabling a terrorist organization itself. So <clears throat> he thinks it was the wrong move. And uh, before we start, uh, oh, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. This came out a couple of weeks ago. This is Ghani, the last president from Afghanistan, who has kept quiet ever since August the 15th when he left the country. I took all the money with him. Yeah. And this was in the New York Times. Uh, Ghani criticized the United States for negotiating directly with the Taliban without involving the Afghan government, saying that, for example, this is just an example, the release of thousands of Taliban prisoners, which was part of the deal, it was carried out. Emboldened the insurgents to ultimately overthrew his government. So, okay, before we start discussing, Edna will talk to you about the what happened afterwards, and we have to exchange. Yes, yeah. you're gonna. Yeah. Close yours. Where is your? Right here. Okay. But you might want to close. Oh, I see. Let's see. Oh, let's just sit here. Okay. No, let's not. Uh, 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 Steve, can you close this scan? I'm used to uh, just close it up. I don't know. Let me see. Yeah. Anyway, uh, while, while he's doing that, the kids set up. Okay, which one is it? Uh, I can I can find that. It's just um, okay. Um, what I wanted to say is, I, I did not like. Well, I don't know why it's doing that. Yeah, okay. Um, just close this out. And I'll just talk about it. I mean, it's not essential, but um, unless I, you know, I don't take too much time for a quick up. What I was going to say is, I do, I do not uh, like. Well, why don't you sit there and I'll try to manipulate in the meantime? Okay. I did not like the book for a number of reasons. I think that Masters is an advocate for uh, the militarization of foreign policy. The, uh, the other thing I didn't like about it is in a prior book, in prior books, he made a central theme of honor and ethical responsibilities to those serving the uh, President of the United States. But I don't think he did so when he served Trump. He says that he's above partisanship, but most of that book is a critique of Obama policies. Um, he never mentions how we first got involved in Iraq, for example, and the false premises doing so um, there, there are a lot of things that I didn't like at all about the book you know uh, Trump's policies were pretty factless and uh, he doesn't get into any of the specifics because he wants to be above the fray they so want to take the media to and um, you know, for example, he advised Trump not to break the deal with Iran. But then in the book, it's all about how terrible the deal was. Okay. So uh, I, I believe fundamentally that he believes in war. 
and in the America's ability uh, to enforce its uh, interests by the threat or use of force, which I fundamentally disagree with. Our power is primarily stemmed from our economic and political alliances and in a sense makes us, makes us unique in history with how we created these alliances to create a certain world. Yes, it's in the ESU, uh, go up, uh, ESU, yeah, presentation, Afghanistan closed. Okay. So, you know, the first question that I, that I like to ask is, you know, what is Afghanistan? You know, it's not a country that has been in existence for that long, since the 19th century. So what is it? It's a British construct. Why, why was it constructed? create a buffer state between the Russian Empire and warm waters. They wanted the Russians kept making trouble for them in what's now Pakistan and northern India to undermine its abilities. Has anybody heard of Khorasan? Uh, because ISIS-K stands for ISIS Khorasan. And what is uh, uh, it's an Iranian word. It's an allusion, allusion to Iran, Afghanistan, and part of Pakistan. It means the land of the sun. Thank you. So, um, as I said, it's an English construct. And one of the difficulties we've all heard about is tribal element. Well, until uh, the middle to late 19th century, there was no such thing as any form of central government. It was a uh, sort of coalition of different tribes who would come to certain agreements as to how they would deal with each other. When we went in, what did we try to do? We tried to impose a central government and undermine the way they had been doing business for 150 years. The Russians had tried the same thing under a communist government, and it failed because that's not their history. There's too many ethnic, uh, religious, in terms of different forms of Islam, especially Shiites, and um, cultural historical differences. The Tajiks in the north have almost nothing to do with the Pashtun majority, and Pashtuns are, are uh, mostly Pakistani Pashtuns. So, um, you know, this is our, our misperception. So, Afghanistan in 2019, when we were still pumping money in like crazy, was one of the world's poorest countries, and it ranks 113th at that time. Now it's much lower, much, much lower. Four out of five people live in rural areas, still to this day. Uh, the central government was dependent on uh, more than 40% of its non-military budget on the United States and foreign assistance. So, Without that assistance, there was no way for the central government to even um, effectuate any policies because they didn't have any money. So, um, as you all know, the U.S., through the World Bank and the IMF, froze all the assets that has been allocated to the Afghani state. That's our money. <laughs> it's, it's the money that the West said, we're going to give you. 
and the uh, Biden administration put a complete freeze on, uh, on certain conditions. One was inclusivity in government, that it couldn't just be the Pashtuns in the South. That's what it basically is today. To protect the gains made by women, which have been enormous. The, the number of women that uh, were receiving education at a high school level or above was 6% when we first got there. 6%. When we left, it was over 40% that were going to high school. Huge difference. Transformational, if you will. And the uh, third thing was to prevent uh, there being any retaliation against uh, their, their opponents. Uh, th there's a fourth understanding which we've always had with them since we started negotiating in Doha which was that they had to sever the relationship with Al-Qaeda and other uh, terrorist groups. Now, when Steve mentioned how all these prisoners were released from uh, prison, one, one of the things that when they were released, a large number of them were from ISIS-K, who hate the Taliban and are the ones that have been blowing up mosques and uh, committing other atrocities in the last couple of months. Okay, they're the ones that blew up, you know, at uh, by uh, the hotel, by the airport where 120 plus people were killed, plus 17 Marines. Was it 17? I think so. Any case, very recently, last month, uh, less than a month ago, the United States uh, realized that unless they released some monies, that Afghanistan would face uh, a catastrophe, okay? Um, so basically, Afghanistan's economy since uh, September has shrunk by 30%, okay? There's no liquidity, there's no cash. They are now going, uh, they've now gone through the third year of the worst drought that anybody knows of. Uh, the wheat production is down by 25%. They still depend on it. You know what a, a lot of farmers who are able to, to that have some liquidity, richer farmers, what are they doing? They're planting opium because Opium doesn't need a lot of water. It's a stressed vegetation. And it's the way the Taliban have made money and funded themselves for the last 20 years. You have basically a lack of capital. Uh, food processing uh, plants are running out of uh, you know, flour for bakeries, et cetera, et cetera collapse of agriculture, and as I say, huge in increase of opium, which we will no doubt see the results of. 23 of Pakistan's 38, 39 million people uh, face life-threatening in insecurity, and it's estimated by the UN, whether you take those figures for real or not, 8 million face famine this year. Three million children are already so badly mal malnourished that their lives are permanently affected, even if they get food. That's the reasons why we have finally agreed, because of the pleading of international relief organizations, to say, "Look, it's not these people's fault. You know, they're, they're going to be fine." Uh, uh, by the millions if we don't intervene. So there's no wartime economy. It's true that people are greatly, greatly relieved that they don't have to worry about uh, bullets, flying bombs, dropping, and all that stuff. There's no doubt that most people are hugely relieved after basically uh, not just 20 years. This has been going on since 1979, I think, when uh, the uh, communists uh, and the Soviets went in. 
the Taliban were hoping for Pakistan and China to act as a backstop to help provide funds. They haven't gotten it. First of all, Pakistan can't afford it. Uh, and China is very wary of getting too involved. Nobody's being paid. No government worker, no teacher, no doctors at uh, hospitals, et cetera. And they've, they've, they've been unpaid for four months. Um, obviously, the price of foodstuffs has skyrocketed. Bribery. Steve mentioned corruption. You know, the way they perceive corruption is different than the way we perceive it. For there to be corruption in the way that we see it, you have to have standards of law that are accepted by the bulk of the population. If you don't have laws governing the way in which people uh, transact with each other, how can you have, if, if there aren't those laws, how can you have corruption? It's the corruption of those laws. It's the way that they've always done business. Okay, I'm the middleman, what's in it for me? You're dealing with me and you, we've got to go through somebody else. You know, somebody's got to take a cut. That's why they're there. So, um, but, you know, apparently at the borders where foodstuffs are coming in, government officials are taking a bigger and bigger slice because they know they can. Um, what's happened? Women's roles diminished. They've been excluded from the government. There have been executions in a number of provincial cities. Uh, former successful pro women professionals have been hunted down and are in hiding because the central government of the Taliban cannot enforce the policy. Even if they believe that there should be no retribution, they can't enforce that. Um, schools in the provinces have banned girls in the high schools. However, I think, I'm just extrapolating it, um, that the recent decisions in the northern province, which are mostly Tajik, they have uh, opened up the uh, high schools to women, segregated, completely segregated. One of the biggest prob problems, challenges, is they didn't have segregated schools. So there's not enough teachers. The teachers they have are being underpaid or not paid, and they don't have facilities to have classes for boys, classes for girls. And that's another uh, problem. The universities, and there's I think 19 universities, which shocked me when I, that, you know, a lot of private. They, they have staffing problems, they have all these challenges aside from the fact that they have to assure the government that women will be taught separately from, from men. Can you imagine the added cost of repeating every single class because you've got two different populations? Well, excuse me, but how were they doing it before? Because weren't the women in the classes with the men? Yes. They were. But yes. now they can't. Now they can't. Okay. That even if you're a private institution, they're uh, well over, nobody knows for sure. These are very uh, vague kind of estimates that there are over a half a million displaced people uh, within Afghanistan because there's no food, there's no support system. They're going to the major cities. Um, before the Taliban took over, there were already 780,000 refugees, Afghani refugees in Iran. Since that, another 300,000 plus have gone to Iran. Part of it is because they're Shia and uh, they're hated by the Taliban. There's 1.4 million refugees in Pakistan. Okay. And that number keeps growing. Yeah. Uh, it complicates everything in Pakistan too. 
And you cannot look at the Taliban as being separate from what happened in Pakistan for the 25 plus years that Saudi Arabia financed all these madrasas, Islamic schools, that were pushing a Wahhabi, uh, very strict Islamic, anti-feminine uh, type uh, approach. You don't think that after 25 years that has an impact on Pakistan, a completely different place today than it was, say, 40, 50 years ago. It's un almost unrecognized. And, be, and in large measure because of that. So the same thing happened in uh, in Afghanistan. One of the things that Masters never gets into is how we, because of our world politics, went after um, the Soviets and the, the Soviet puppet uh, regime in Afghanistan by supplying all the jihadists with all kinds of weapons, very effective uh, weapons. Just People that became our enemies had been okay, allies. And the other thing that I totally disagree with, and it's been shown by a number of, of writers, that the reason that we never got uh, uh, bin Laden at Tora Tora was General Frank uh, Forbade the small contingency of American troops and CIA operatives and Afghan, uh, mostly northern uh, province supporters, from getting him when he was very vulnerable and going in straight away. They wanted to wait until they had thousands of troops. And by that time, phew, he was gone. So we had that opportunity. We knew exactly where he was. And that slipped away. Uh, so with all these refugees, I, I discovered that there are scammers from all over the world that, you know, you can set up a fake uh, phone number through Google and people from Africa to uh, Russia, all over the world that are preying on refugees by telling them that they can set up, um, you know, uh, sponsorship that are totally fictitious. Um, 22,500 uh, had settled in the United States. Remember, we've got 130,000 people out. Uh, and one of the disingenuous arguments about, oh, we left American citizens behind, et cetera. They're dual national citizens and say, you know, the grandma who's dependent on her family doesn't want to leave. And the, 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 the professional son, daughter, family doesn't want to leave her behind. They didn't leave. This is all our internal political BS that we perpetrate for partisan uh, reasons. Um, so, uh, 90, I, I found that 97,000 refugees from Afghanistan have settled in the United States in the last 20 years. And the biggest places for location are California, Texas, and Virginia. One of the problems is while they have Afghani kind of communities, et cetera, and very adept into integrating people uh, because one in five refugees find employment within a year of coming here. The problem is the costs are so high in California and other places. So people, you know, the governor of Oklahoma has been encouraging people to come in, but it's a lot cheaper. But the problem is once you start getting away from metro, you know, cosmopolitan areas, is much more local antipathy to seeing groups come in. But on the whole, the United States has been very successful in integrating uh, uh, refugees. Um, so, um, 
divisions started occurring within Taliban almost immediately. And one of the uh, uh, leaders, uh, Bandadar, who was the main negotiator in Doha with the United States during you know, that whole period of, 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 of negotiation before the uh, Taliban took over, it's more moderate. The Haqqanis, uh, uh, you know, are extremely radical, pretty much a murderous lot. And um, they're being uh, conflicts. Um, as mentioned earlier, the uh, ISIS for Khorasan is, uh, has killed hundreds in the last three months. And most of those people came from the prisons that the Taliban insisted all the prisoners to be released. Do you think it's only hundreds? Uh, who knows? So, um, the last thing is the Taliban, you know, you don't see clarity in our reporting in this country. So, it's been declared a caliphate. A caliphate, by definition, doesn't accept the Western notion of a nation state, which only came about really in the 19th century, right? Uh, and the head, the titular head of the Taliban, the head of government, is uh, got the title of Amir al Mumineen, which is very much like the Arabic, which means the leader, Amir, of the believers. Not Afghan believers, not, not of the believers, the Muslim believers. Okay. And way back when, uh, when they were in power the first time around, they had uh, what's called the Bayat, which is a Islamic, uh, religiously um, kind of sanctioned or intoned pledge of loyalty. The reason why they didn't just break off with the terrorists, the Al Qaeda to begin with, is because they had basically sworn an oath of loyalty, which if you're Muslim, you can't really break. It's easier to get a divorce than to, to, to break that. So that still exists. Now, Pakistan, Iran, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, which is having a lot of problems right now, China and Russia, they all see potential threats from the establishment of the Taliban. Believe me, they're thrilled that the United States is out. But they don't want to take over that that game. And they're very worried of the potential cross-boundary impact that it might have on the radical movements that do exist in Uzbekistan, in uh, Kazakhstan, etc. And Iran is mostly worried about just even more and more influx of Shia Afghan, you know, Iran is in a pickle itself. It, it's got huge problems. They got to feed these millions that are coming in. It, it's it, or millions. It's a problem. So they're all taking a wait and see type attitude. My feeling is that unless the Taliban become more inclusive and go back to the uh, traditional way of different tribes, etc., hashing out their differences and reaching compromise and having a somewhat decentralized form of government, that you'll see another civil war in Afghanistan in the next couple of years again. Because it's always been about power sharing. Unless somehow they get, you know, China or somebody to help 
institute uh, a nation of terror. Uh, I, I, I think that's almost inevitable. Lastly, uh, the impact on Pakistan. Pakistan is a very, very complex place. But it's really unfortunate how distorted uh, its, its you know, main Islamic uh, faith has been perverted mostly through the influence of Saudi Arabia. Um, and you know, Pakistan is probably the biggest danger for the world. They have hundreds of nuclear weapons. They can be a big, big problem. You know, and, and that central government, you know, the military basically rules Pakistan indirectly. And if they were to lose that or become so radicalized themselves, who knows who they might give a nuclear weapon. I think there's a big threat. Afghanistan is not. So that's that's all I got. Thank you very much. Let me close this and uh, get into the. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you. So, okay, so here we are, uh, 20 years after we went into Afghanistan. Uh, it sounds like a defeat to me, but uh, uh, at the same time, it sounds like it's the right thing to do. Um, so all the governments that wanted to do it couldn't do it for various reasons. I'm talking about even even the, the, the Bush government wanted to leave, but it couldn't leave, and then the Obama government wanted to leave at the end. They really surged it up, as you saw in the number of uh, troops that uh, were sent to Afghanistan, up to 100,000. Anyway, I don't want to talk anymore. I would like to pass it on to uh, the group members. Yes. After listening, I have not read the book. Uh, after listening to Ed and your comments, I agree that McMaster is pure army, that this country has not learned a thing in the last 200 years about dealing with tribal um, entities. Look what we did to the American Indians. We didn't know what to do with them. We don't know what to do with the tribes in Afghanistan. It's just, we don't have the, since we're a democracy, we don't have the understanding, I believe, of what it's like to be a tribal society. Other, other opinions? <clears throat> First I have one. Or two or three. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you've seen this, but in 2007, yes, granted, anybody who's entitled to change their mind. But President Biden said, there's no way we can get out of Afghanistan in less than, than a year. We can't do it correctly. We can't get the equipment out. We can't do it. So if you want to say that he changed his mind, okay, somebody changed his mind. And, you know, these I think these politicians need to be held accountable to to what they have said in the past. I do. Um, in terms of the map, I'm sure, and I know we're talking about after Afghanistan. So there was also a remark made, you know, well, they had to get out by September. Well, the, the time frame between April and September is five months, five or six months. And I'm sure you saw the map that showed uh, the Taliban encroaching on Kabul. I mean, it was by the day. It was dramatic. So, no, but it's no secret any more than Omicron. It's no secret that this was happening. It was happening, and it wasn't dealt with, in my opinion, <laughs> properly. Um, also, in this 2007 video, <laughs> Biden said that um, troops have to be left behind. They have to be. Because otherwise, the Taliban is going to take a foothold. Well, I think he was right back then. 
So what happened? I don't know. And then, you know, there were special ops, the Pineapple Express and Project Dynamo. These were retired SEAL special operations who risked their lives to go into Afghanistan and try and rescue some of these people. So yes, I'm sure there were some disputes among family members, but I, I just, I'm shamed by that, that retired military have to go in and try and help people who are stranded. I really, really am offended by that. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just a, a couple of points. When uh, Biden was vice president, he pushed constantly uh, for uh, the administration to pull out of Afghanistan. Um, there's so many things, I mean, that, that I find uh, going to McMaster's book and what people say, for example, about uh, what happened during the Obama administration. Under Bush, we signed an agreement with the Iraqi government, for example, that we would leave. And then, of course, when uh, the Obama administration followed that agreement, they were excoriated because of the consequences of that decision. You can't talk about one thing and not the other. You can't, it's like, you know, Obama is excoriated for not retaliating against outside uh, using chemical weapons when there was a red line. Uh, but people forget, what did he do? He went to Congress for authorization. Why did Obama win in the first place? Because he was one of the very few that was against the Iraq war. Okay, and people by that, by 2008, were sick and tired of it. Okay, when Assad came along, he didn't want to repeat the uh, experience of having a president make a decision and attack without the authorization of Congress. What did all the Republicans do? They denied him the vote to attack Syria in response to it. And what do they say today? Uh, look how weak he was. He wouldn't, uh, he set a red line and then he wouldn't follow through. So, uh, you know, when we look historically, unfortunately, you look through just partisan uh, types of, uh, of spectacles. And that's the problem in this country. Our foreign policy is predominantly determined by how it helps one party versus the other. It's about the internal dynamics going on projected to the world outside. Most OECD countries, etc., they have, as we do, a professional State Department, but the difference there is that they don't have, you know, most or a third of their ambassadorships to the most important places be political appointees, some of whom know nothing about anything and they're just political payoffs. Okay, so, it, 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 you know, uh, if you were in the State Department and you made it a career, you know right away from the get-go practically that your chances of making one of the 130, because we don't have ambassadors to every single country. Some represent us in multiple countries, like in Africa, you know, that you have a small shot at getting to the top. And then you're going to be told by some bumbling idiot that this is what you got to do when you, that person doesn't know anything. So, you know, I do think that we need to institutionally start changing some of the things that we do. I'm not advocating that we eliminate all political appointees, but I don't think it should be more than maybe a dozen. And the other terrible thing is, do you realize that until last month, we had 60 odd 
uh, ambassadorships open because Ted Cruz and uh, Marco Rubio were preventing uh, the approval of ambassadorships. That's another thing. They shouldn't have to go through that system at all, except for the most important places. They were using it as a bargaining chip. Yes. I don't remember what for. But but to, for, for uh, to, so that Biden would stop the Nord Stream to gas line. You know? It, it, it's just a terrible system that we've now got in place. This stuff never happened before. You know, you go back 20, 30 years, you'd have pretty much unanimity by the U.S. Senate uh, committee, for almost pro forma. Once in a while, they get some real nutcase in front of them, and they try to dissuade the president from actually having that uh, come up. Oh, I, I agree with this. I don't think Congress is taking the role that they're intended in a replacement of that as executive orders. Well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And Congress doesn't have to agree. And I, I don't agree with that. No, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, we should just stop having ambassadors requiring Senate approval, except for maybe the most important 10 positions in the world where it could have an impact. But it, it, it's a crazy thing. I have a question for you. No, no, very quickly. Why your special interest in Afghanistan? Why? No, I don't have a special interest uh, no, more so. No, I mean, I looked no, at. I was wondering. No, no, I looked at the Middle East, but you know, Afghanistan. No, you have not been living in Afghanistan. No, 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 no. I, I mean, I've known people who've gone there, et cetera. It's supposed to be a beautiful country, uh, geographically. It has a very rich uh, culture. But how many countries have been going through more than 50 years of war, which is what Afghanistan has been going through? 50 years. It's in that country, that's more than two generations. Always yeah. war. Um, turning to a, a the Barbara. Oh, Barbara. Go ahead, Barbara. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted, I, I kind of agree with Fred, uh, Ed, about he was saying about what happens, you know, uh, I remember back, I think Bush was, it's had senior Bush had put some troops into Somalia, and then they made an agreement to take him out, and then Clinton had to do the withdrawal. And I think this is something that's happening more and more. You, you make it with one person, the next president you know, tries to follow what was set the year before so that we, you know, don't go back on our agreements. But the problem is pulling out of these places, you know, elegantly. We certainly didn't see that in Afghanistan. Let's face it, we all remember Vietnam also trying to pull out of there. It's, it's, it's just very messy to get uh, to start these military invasions. And then, you know, at the end, somebody is, has to pull out and then it's always somewhat messy. But um, no, I have been to Afghanistan years back. I was there in 1977, and uh, I remember all of the women still wearing the the the, the things around their heads, you know, and the, just the gauze that you can see. So that's not something that's new. <laughs> that that's been ha happening for quite some time. Well, I'd like to um, ask the question of what do you people think? what we should do now. Uh, here we are, okay? Here's the situation. Afghanistan, like Ed has said, is, is going down into the, the bad years, into the bad years. Uh, and so what, what should the United States policy be from here on? What do you guys think? What do you think? We have no business, <clears throat> we have no business interfering in um, internal politics in other countries until we are asked or attacked or attacked yes i think we should at least send non non-governmental agencies to help distribute the food i mean 300 and something million dollars and these people according to the new york magazine today are on the brink of yeah, they're really in bad shape, and I, I don't, I don't like the feeling. And you know, people want to call the withdrawal messy. Some people want to call it great. 
But I think it could have been done better. But that's a hindsight uh, remark. I certainly don't know how. Right, it was missing. Well, we we do have. There are international agencies. There, there are. Uh, there's an American that leads one effort, and he's he's been raising the issue for uh, weeks and successfully. Again, I don't think anybody in this country wants to see millions of people starve to death. On the other hand, I don't think that we should be uh, involved at all. Uh, China, Pakistan, all of them are are watching to see what happens. I don't think that we have much in the way of any influence other than using the money that was already set aside by Congress, et cetera, and other uh, you know, Western countries that has that ten billion dollars in 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 reserve that we use that money other than food and medicine, we use that money as leverage to try to moderate the behavior of whatever government shapes up to be. But I don't think we should give them that money other than for food and, and medicine. The only thing is the only thing is that when you give them money, they put it in their own pocket. I mean, you know, they don't really think to give it to to the people who need the food. Well, from what I see is that the grain, you know how the United States gives food? I mean, we, the government subsidized a lot of our agriculture by buying up mountains of food, okay? And then we give that food away, or as forms of aid, we give them the wheat or whatever it is, and they pay us in the local currency that's not transferable outside of the country. So we amass whatever the money is inside that country that then has to be spent in, in that country. Right now, they're not paying for it, and the and and the wheat, et cetera, is coming directly from the federal government. So, um, and I don't I don't see that as being the concern. I don't think there's any money being transacted. What's happening, unfortunately, is it goes into its best son and then comes in on lorries. The Taliban customs agent will go, okay, for every five bags of, of hundred pounds of wheat. We get one. That's what happens. I, I want to comment about withdrawal first. Anytime you withdraw without a victory, you are withdrawing in quagmire and it will be a mess. Some better than others, it will be dissatisfactory to literally everybody involved. We will say, well, it wasn't as bad as Vietnam. Well, that's probably true, but it was still all awful. Is when you don't have a victory, and we haven't had a military victory since World War II. Everything we've done has been done, if you'll pardon me, in a half ass man. That's, I mean, six years with the Air Force Reserve. Okay. Um, and a son who's a major in Vermont National Guard. Military plan. Okay. okay, going on to the United States, however, we might be well advised to look at what China is doing. China is not exporting weaponry. They're, they're exporting highways, bridges, schools, hospitals, airports, ports. China is building a whole bunch of ports, especially in Africa, so that they can sell their goods. They're not bothering with this military stuff. Okay, they're just not, it's not that there isn't some of that, but where we have always focused on providing a lot of military aid. That's been our way of doing it. McMaster's is a military person. What he says there is what you should expect from a general with his background. That's what you're going to get. Not everybody is Al Gray, okay, former commandant of the Marine Corps, who used to think about these things and would ask the, the planners, what do you want it to look like when we're done? We don't do that anymore. We just do these stupid things and then wonder. Now, a lot of those things are precipitated by our current political state in the United States because there is no central, there's nothing 
common happening like we used to have. I mean, I remember the days of singing patriotic songs as a kid, right? We don't do that anymore. I mean, we don't, we used to teach civics. As a person who sponsored a model airplane club in a middle school for seven years, let me tell you, we do not teach civics. Okay? Kids don't know nothing. So it's just, I mean, it's a whole, it's, we, we really have got to look at our own internal self. Before, you know, if you're not good for yourself, you're not good for anybody else. I just uh, like to make a comment. Yes. Uh, okay, so China uh, just supplied Pakistan with six advanced submarines. Okay. They've uh, supplied them with very sophisticated fighters, etc. And the Burma, the government of Burma, that is uh, killing its own citizenry, would not be uh, able to do any of it without military aid. So China, you know, does uh, does it in a very targeted way. Our policy, in large measure, is because we have what Eisenhower feared, a military-industrial complex. And so what happens is somebody says, you know, we need new fighters. Do we really? Not? We absolutely have to have them. Well, what are you going to do with those? Well, we're going to sell them to this country and that country. And if it's a country that we're not sure about, they're not going to get the full fighter thing. They're going to get the trainer. Okay? And then, the, you know, they offset those sales against all the money that they have to spend for new stuff. And it's a, it's a washing machine cycle. Yes. What this gentleman here said about patriotic songs, you know, I like that. You know, how can we expect to have a military that wants to fight for our country if everybody's talking about how awful it is? Oh, the United States is just so awful. Why would you want to go kill yourself for the United States? It's absurd. And this idea of promoting equity, you know, we have so many important issues that are not being addressed. I'm sorry, I, I don't agree. Uh, the other final comment I wanted to make was about the generals who claimed that they followed Biden's instructions to a letter, and yes, everything that Biden said, that was what was done, and that's what they wanted. But of course, when they got in front of Congress, there was a different story. They did not want that. They did not agree to that, and what they had wanted was to leave a force behind that would keep the Taliban from taking a foothold, and that was not done. But that's what they testified in Congress. We could not keep the Taliban out when we had tens of thousands of people. The, the one real scandal in this and in Iraq, which nobody covers, is when you see the trillions of dollars that have been spent over 20 years. Where did that money go? And people say, well, well, of course, the Iraqis and the Afghanis, they stuffed their pockets full of money. There was undoubtedly millions that were missing, but not hundreds of millions or billions. It went to American contractors. The U.S. government Pay all these independent American contractors for their services who made hundreds of billions of dollars. And nobody covers that story. That's how it works. How much did Danny take with him when he left Afghanistan? Uh, that, you know, I wow. doubt it. No, I don't know that it was that much because, as uh, you know, cash, ever since they stopped making $500 bills, et cetera, you got to take out ones or tens or twenties. There's even not a, that many hundreds. So you need, for a million dollars of cash, on the average, you need six suitcases. Nobody saw him take a hundred suitcases. So, you know, I'm sure he got millions, but not hundreds of millions. What is that preposition? Marie? Um, our next meeting is February 3rd. For those of, for those of you who ordered the books, Marie yeah. 
Uh, they have been shipped. Uh, I just spoke to the guy at the Foreign Affairs Office, and he said we should have them by January 11th, which means I will have them in the office on Monday the 13th. So you couldn't, if they come on time. I thought it was a Friday. This coming 11th is a Tuesday. Okay, well then I will have them in the office on the 13th, which is Wednesday. <clears throat> and um, I will bring, as soon as I get them, I will bring them to the office and you can pick up your books. We'll let you know by email. Yes, I will send out an email blast about the books. I just wanted to say I really like this format. How about it? Good. 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 What is the topic? Do you know? I have no idea. I don't have a book. <laughs> I, I, I have one here, but uh, it's just taking its time opening up. Uh -huh. Hold on one second. Uh, opening is taking a little longer than usual. Hang tight. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. <laughs> Taking stock. Okay, outer space policy, chapter one. Okay. Well, I can go outer space. Military, civil, outer and commercial space, space. Technology. Otherwise uh, known as uh, space force. This, you know, what's his name? Um, oh, oh, Star Wars. Captain Kirk. Bessos. Bessos space. Thank you very much for coming.